advance here and only here. This microphone, your slides are there. Okay, thanks, Marty. Hi, morning, everyone. Heidi Sasig from the Northeast Shelf. I, I noticed a, a theme at the marine sites. I've also just stepped off a research cruise last Friday. Uh, it was super rough. Um, if you see me with a wide stance and kind of swaying to stay upright, don't be alarmed. I'm still having what we affectionately call doc rock. Um, okay, so NES uh, Insight News, we also have just uh, submitted our uh, phase two proposal, waiting to, to hear and uh, very much looking forward to, we hope, starting NES2 in the fall. And when we submitted that proposal, we brought two new PIs up from our um, affiliated investigators. So I uh, introduce Gordon Zhang and Mei Sato to you. Um, okay, so spatial scaling um, in our, is very, um, for populations and communities, as well as other aspects, is really important in our site, just like the other marine sites. We're um, dealing with a really wide variety of scales. So we have high resolution time series in a near shore site. We have observations that extend hundreds of kilometers across strong gradients across the whole shelf. Um, and then we have what we call the broad scale in collaboration with NOAA, where we're surveying a thousand plus kilometers across the whole Northeast US shelf. And what I'm gonna talk about today is a way that we're trying to do direct evaluation of our ability to scale knowledge about communities by using the same observational technique across with high resolution across all of these, um, all of these scales. And I'll just uh, emphasize that I think Russ brought up that the advective processes are, and also for CE, CCE, the advective processes are really huge here. So we've got kilometers per day of water movement through this system. So we can't ignore this kind of scaling question. And the answers aren't really aren't obvious about how much we can scale our knowledge. Um, so just a quick reminder, our, our food webs are based on microscopic primary producers. I'm gonna highlight how we're looking at scaling in those communities. Um, today, but we're also looking further up, up the, the food web. The mi microscopic primary producers are extremely diverse and, I'll, um, and range a lot in size, taxonomy, and um, their physiological capabilities. And I'm just going to highlight the cases of two end member taxa that are really important in our system. Very tiny picocyanobacteria, one micron um, in size, and then at the larger size end, these chain forming diatoms that dominate the biomass in the microplankton. These are the time series for our near shore observatory site where you see that there's a very distinct seasonal trade off between these organisms. The small cells dominate in the summer and the larger cells dominate in the fall and winter. So we've known this for a while. Um, the big question is how much can we take this knowledge up to larger spatial scales within the system? So using similar kinds of observational techniques that we're using um, at the observatory, we're now going across the shelf. This is the example for the Pico cyanobacteria cynicococcus, where um, student in the, our project, Bethany Stevens, has been able to show that yes, indeed, the seasonality that we observe in cynicococcus at the nearshore observatory does extend all the way across the shelf. The amplitude is modulated, but exactly the same seasonal patterns are showing up across the whole region. So there seems to be a common um, importance and seasonal regulation of this organism. Uh, similarly, we've had a scaling success on the with this, this diatom. Um, postdoc Dylan Catlett has been looking at the broad scale survey data with uh, the same kind of imaging technique that we're using at the near shore observatory and has been able to show that in, indeed across the whole region, the biggest blooms, this, this organism dominates across the region. We didn't even know that when we started. And we knew it dominated at the near shore, but we didn't know if it was important across the region. Now we know it is, and it has a similar seasonal pattern. These are composite maps based on 13 years of seasonal surveys showing that the hot spots of that organism, it's not even, but they're, they're predominantly in fall and, um, and winter in most of the region. I just want to quickly highlight that we're not just describing patterns and the way that we can um, scale up our knowledge of the patterns, but we're also working to scale up our understanding of the mechanisms that produce those patterns. Um, in the case of the picocyanobacteria, Bethany's work has shown that the temperature, um, physiological temperature regulation that we know is important in the near shore system is also applying across the entire shelf. So they're physiologically limited by cold temperatures where in the diatom we learned at the near shore observatory that a lot of their um, bloom dynamics are regulated by high mortality from parasites. We now know from Dylan's work that those parasites are important across the whole region. 
and they also have a similar um, seasonality to their impact on mortality, we think cold temperatures in the winter are giving a refuge from high mortality because the parasitism is suppressed at that time of year, and that's why these organisms bloom in the winter. Um, I'm running out of time, but I just uh, tried to answer a few of the questions in the template. Um, our direct scaling approach has a challenge in that it only works for the types of observations that we can make in this automated high resolution way. We're uh, really uh, benefiting from leveraging with our NOAA partners for the broad scale sampling. Um, we're generating new hypotheses now about the ways that increased heat prevalence of heat waves, decreased prevalence of cold snaps may be impacting population and community dynamics in our system. And I'll just end by saying that um, it didn't, doesn't always work. And um, what in the template was called a facial scaling failure, I think is a really interesting surprise. Sometimes what we see offshore is totally different than what we've ever seen in the near shore. And those are some of the um, you know, more interesting things that we're looking at going forward. And I uh, invite you to talk to my colleague, Rubao Ji, who's here at this meeting about the ways that we're looking at spatial scaling in important consumers in, in NES.